protector <laughs> where's the butterfly protector from come on surely you remember the first time we met <laughs> I shall i remind that. you okay a lot <laughs> of water under the bridge i'm not sure whether to put this i'm going to put this on two different shows you're going to go on the book show and you're going to go on messengers of light cool Bring it on. so i'm going to dig deep Okay, so but let me remind you, 2012, Buck Spiritual Friends. Oh, come on, you must remember. Buck Spiritual Friends, the group I used to run. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember? You turned up with a butterfly. Did I really? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you had this little butterfly. You sat with the butterfly continuously all through the meditations and you took care of it do you, you don't remember i do yeah i do yeah bless it was the first it. time i ever met you there was me and helen helen greenway mm -hmm. and martin and i can't I, I don't remember who else was there but you made an impression <laughs> you made an impression <laughs> walking in with a butterfly that was a big impression and i from that moment on, it was like, wow, Jamie's here. It's just a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful aura, beautiful presence. And uh, we kind of became friends. And then you came to the Seekers Trust in um, when we did the angel retreats. Mm -hmm. yeah, Remember that? Yeah. With your friend Jamie, the other Jamie. And that was an amazing retreat. That was beautiful. And uh, and then and um, I didn't hear from you. Then you went to live in Ibiza. It was quite and uh, you were always asking me to come and visit, and I never got to visit you. And then I'm just going through the the chronological order of of um, the times that we met up. And then um, then you did your cacao ceremony. Um, where was that again? I can't remember the time. That was in Swindon. Swindon. That was it. And it was the year before the madness when we were still living in relative uh, normality, whatever. And you did this amazing cacao ceremony. And that was the first time I'd seen you since the retreat, I think, which must have been about six or seven, maybe seven years, eight years. Mm, yeah. retreat, and you did this brilliant cacao ceremony. And then last year I went to Trafalgar Square to one of our marches, one of our things. I was standing there filming, and there you were, <laughs> right over there filming beside me, and it was you, oh my God. Right under so, David Icke's nose, wasn't it? Right Ed? We were right under David Icke's nose. Yes, uh, we were. The man who's, we're probably not allowed to say his name on here, it's so crazy. So um, what I'm gonna do is I've gotta say to you, there's very little we can say on the toolbox, you can say what you want about the book, but when it comes to the activist toolbox, we, we're being watched gratuitously. So you have to be very careful what you say. But let's go back a bit. 
let's go back to Jamie that walked in with the butterfly, that innocent, very innocent, very sweet, very smiley young person that walked in. Um, how did that all start? I mean, where did this all come from? When? Did, how did you wake up? Well, I mean, I've always sort of been spiritual because of my mum. Um, but waking up to what's going on in the world was what really blew my mind open. I watched a two and a half hour long documentary that connected all of the dots. And I'll try and use my words very carefully not to <laughs> not to bring up anything. But um, it, it told you about everything that's going on, who's behind it, connected all of the dots, spoke of their motives, how they're doing it. And once you'd seen that, you know, it's impossible not to see it in real life. You know, wherever you go, it's there in your face. You know, you can't unsee it. It's like the, you know, it's like the film they live, you know, once you've seen it, you know, you can't take the damn glasses off, can you? Um, can I just go back even further with you? Mm. What I mean is, when, when did you wake up to the spirituality? I mean, not, it's unusual for someone, especially a, a young man, to walk in protecting a butterfly and to sit there and to give it so much attention and love. It, it, it is, it's unusual. <laughs> so, <I don't> <laughs> well, so why, how, what? How old were you when you first realized that you were spe a star seed or a light worker? Or there was something a bit different about you, Jamie? Uh, that's kind of always been me, really. Um, just and I thank my mum for that you know she, my mum's reads all the spiritual magazines and she's always been into that sort of stuff so it's kind of always been a part of my life so, and um, my mum's very sweet and she's I spent a lot of my childhood not hanging around with my friends but actually hanging out with my mum and she'd take me out into nature we'd go on really long bike rides together and so yeah we'd climb trees and I was always into nature and animals butterflies you know birds whatever so yeah it's kind of always been me a little bit really um, I only cracked open properly after like the awakening I was just talking about because once you get open to that stuff then the uh, the spiritual stuff creeps in as well because then you realize actually you know it's it's um, the real um, battle we have is is the battle on consciousness uh, and when and when you realize that um, you start I started digging deep into that stuff as well and that's when I started realizing I had a really deep connection with the Pleiades um, and that, um, that expanded in Ibiza when I decided to participate in a channeling course with Solara and Ra, and uh, I learned to channel the Pleiades, and that's when things really sort of blew open. And that was probably 2015. So that's when the real journey happened, though. 2015? Okay, mm. so we're looking about six years, right? Okay. I, I agree with you totally. When when all of this started, all the lockdowns, it was like it was in my face exactly why I'm here. Mm. I just knew. I knew that I had to run moving on TV and that was it. And suddenly all the pieces came together and I realized what I really am and why I went through the life I went through without going into what's going on too much in the world. As you know, I grew up in Israel. I'm now grateful for that because I'm able to see everything. I'm able to watch everything. I'm able to put across different points of views and stuff like that. And I know why I had to grow up in an atmosphere like that. So it's it's this massive awakening where all of us, the 144,000 of us, we have got our jobs and we know what we're doing. So, okay. So talk a little bit, we'll, we'll go on to, okay, so your awakening was through your mum. You were kind of like Maria from the Sounds of Music, loving cr climbing trees and <laughs> jumping around all over the place. <laughs> like what a free spirit that you are. And you talk a little bit about your your meditations with the Palladians, um, because um, that's very very fascinating. So, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, that, that, was, that, cool. that was a cool journey, journey actually. And it was a bit strange because when I was a kid, I always had this real obsession with that tiny little cluster of stars in the sky. And I'd always see them really faint. Uh, every time I saw them, I was like, oh, cute, there's that little cluster of stars again. And I never knew what my fascination was. I had no idea why. And um, and then later on in life, um, as I was going through this um, 
all my research and the awakening and what's going on in the world. Um, I had spent a day on YouTube just listening to, to music, nothing but music for maybe three or four hours. So all of the recommended track uh, videos were nothing but other music videos, absolutely nothing other than music. And then suddenly this other recommendation popped up that was really out of place and it said a message from the Pleiades. And I had I'd never heard of the Pleiades before. Um, so I just felt really, really compelled to, to watch this video. And then it started off talking about, oh, there's a reason why you never used to fit in with other people at school. There's a reason you have spent your life wondering why people don't see the world the way you do. Um, and I was like, okay, go on then. Uh, and it said, basically, it's because your your being isn't really from this planet. You're used to incarnating on the, you've come here on a mission to help raise the vibration of the planet. And you do so just by being here. You don't actually have to take any action. You do this just by being here, although you'll probably want to take some action. I was like, right, okay. I mean, I was a little bit skeptical, you know, I was like, okay, this is a bit random. Um, and then they said, um, there are, are other being some other also other planets also um, as allies to humans on our awakening journey and uh, there are many beings sat on the edges of their seats right now watching what's unfolding on planet earth so I said okay all right fine if, if you're there then if you're watching show me prove it to me and I honestly I, I, I shit you not Lauren I literally came up in goosebumps and I had this incredible rush through me for about 20 seconds and I was sort of sat there like oh, there's no way I could have induced that myself I was like, right, okay. So then, that's interesting. So then I started studying the Pleiades and what that was all about. Um, and then I think it was probably a year or two later, um, I was at my sister's house and my brother-in-law had built an observatory in the garden, um, which was like a metal shed with a sliding back roof and a, and a, and a telescope. And I was there one day and he, he had no idea about my connection with the Pleiades and stuff. They're not really into this sort of stuff. Um, but he, we had a really clear night. He said, oh, great, clear night tonight. Um, we might be able to see the Pleiades. I said, ah, oh, which one's the Pleiades, Robert? And he said, oh, it's that tiny little cluster of stars up there. And of course, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. No way. So I was like, suddenly everything makes sense now. You know, no wonder I was obsessed with that little star cluster as a kid. And that, for me, was absolute confirmation that this stuff isn't just a load of bollocks, you know. <laughs> There's something really real going on here. Um, and then, yeah, I went traveling when in 2014, I just got really sick of this country and working for other people and stuff. So I just sold all my stuff and decided to go. Ended up in the most cosmic place ever, Ibiza, very contrary to the stereotype it's known for. It's, a, it's an extremely cosmic place, one of the most spiritual places on the planet, I would say. And I met this wonderful woman called Solara and um, she was doing a channel 333 euros. Um, and if I see 333, I kind of feel quite compelled to follow it. That's my magic number. And yeah, she was doing this channeling course where she channeled the plan. No, I have to be here. And um, yeah, within three, after the, within the three days of being there, I had a new family of spiritual family and then a new girlfriend, a place to live. And I was channeling the Pleiades and I was suddenly at home, more at home than I've ever been ever in my life. So then, yeah, that was kind of my journey with the Pleiades. And I still channel them to this day when, you know, pretty regularly and they tell me some pretty cool stuff. Um, they've kept me going. Um, I don't think we have anything to worry about, put it that way, but what they're saying, you know, it sounds that's like- That's what I was gonna ask you. Sorry, that, that's what I was gonna ask you is, can you give us some positive stuff? I mean, I'm getting a lot of positive um, stuff that everything's gonna be okay. We've got one massive storm to go through mm. and it's all going to, you know, we're going to be okay. But I, can you give us some positive stuff? Yeah. There are a lot of people out there, there's so much depression and people are scared and confused. And, but go on then, give us some great stuff. Yeah, one, one of the common themes is that a new plane of existence is emerging of some sorts. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. I haven't asked, maybe I should ask. But there's a speak of like a new a new earth, a new plane of existence. And, you know, those who are working for the light, we are, we are part of it. Um, and this, this seems to tie up with things that the Bible says about the end times and stuff like this, you know, about a new plane of existence. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty exciting. And I think 
we're all basically we're going to be okay. I think a lot a lot of bad things are going to happen, but if you're in the light, you're going to be okay. If you're living in love, if you if you if you believe in the universe or of a higher power of or whatever you whatever label you want to give that, you know, um, then we're going to be okay. But it does seem I'm getting the impression aren't going to be, if I'm honest. Um, you know, one of the, the the message that I channeled on New Year's Eve was that all things are going to happen. And I think we're seeing that unfold now with uh, with the prick. Um, and yeah, they, that, that was brought up specifically. Um, they said that's that's not going to be that's going to be a really tough thing for us, but it's it's going to be OK, basically. I, I totally agree with you. Um, we are in a massive awakening and this is all about people taking responsibility for their bodies and their minds and everything. Mm. And those who can will be okay. And those who can't, um, I have my own feelings about that, but I don't want to go into it too much. But this is, you know, you can use this time to either go completely go under or you can use this in order to wake up and to do what you love. And to me, the gift that I've got here um, is I can get up every day and say to myself, Lauren, what do you want to do? Regardless of how many people watch or how many subscribers I've got, what do you want to do today? Oh, I want to pick up a, a mic and sing all day. <laughs> and that's what I do. Yeah, I, I come on here and I'm doing, at the moment, I'm doing a massive sunshine meditation for everyone because of the fact <laughs> whatever you know the weather and in order to teach people that you don't really need the sun you can recreate the sun yourself you can do that you can your mind you can do whatever you want and so as you said we are here to spread love we are here to spread light and that's it and and it's this incredible knowledge now you know that you're here for a reason I struggled with that my whole life. Anyway, coming back to it's you, it's your story. You're the messenger of light on here. So um, this is very exciting. Now, what you've done is you set up an activist toolbox, which sounds very, very intriguing. And I looked at it a little bit. It looks like a website to help people negotiate different things that are going on, how to deal with them um you know how to negotiate the awakening and the ascension but also very practical stuff which of course we can talk about on here because of the way we're living at the moment and hopefully by this time next year things will be different please god um oh please whatever <laughs> please god please love god is love to me so talk a little bit as much as you can about this activist toolbox we'll start with that what is it how can people access it and what is how is it how did it come to be where did it come from how did you feel why did you feel that you needed to create an activist toolbox yeah i mean it came from maybe back around the 2012 times i was doing a lot of sort of protesting and stuff like that and I was being very I was very heavily involved in the activist world and um, I found um, a lot of people were struggling on how to put their message across and try and wake people up um, it's very difficult to wake people up and get them to listen to you and we can often sound very crazy we you know, we can sound like we're chucking out bold statements about what's going on and for a lot of people those bold statements can be very difficult to grasp they can be very difficult to believe because it challenges their perception of reality it challenges their perception of safety so um firstly i wanted to create a place that would help to educate activists on some really or inspire activists with some really interesting ways and effective ways that they can um use their language wisely they can choose their questions wisely um, that will help people effectively wake up their friends and family and also i wanted to provide activists with some other tools um, on their journey on uh, trying to wake the people 
And that was even just selling stickers. It started off as a really basic idea. And over about eight years, it expanded. And only now is it really being launched and birthed. The universe has been, and my, and my guides have been telling me, this is something you just be patient with. It's going to come at the right time. And now it's about to get birthed. So you'll see, if you go to activiststoolbox.com, um, the website doesn't actually have content yet. It's it's there, but it's, it still doesn't have the content. But um, that's for the next sort of two, three weeks, that's going to be a big focus. And now the universe, they weren't wrong. My guides weren't wrong. Your team will come at the right time. And suddenly I've been meeting all these people who want to get involved, they help out. So over the next few weeks is where we're going to be building it with um, building content. So it's actually activiststoolbox.com with an S after activist. <laughs> okay, sorry, you can actually see what I'm putting on yeah. there. Good. Yeah, but it's you cool. The spelling um, is rubbish. Um, <laughs> sorry, activists. So the first bit, is, there's going to be a few different phases. Firstly, we've got the training camp, the activist training camp online, which is, it runs through everything really. So it talks about... Um, Firstly, how to wake up your family, how to wake up your friends, how to ask the right questions, how to make people think for themselves. So you know, one thing I've discovered and after speaking to a few other people is that people don't tend to change their mind unless they come to the conclusion themselves. And for that to happen, people need to think. So how do we get someone to think? Well, we have to ask them questions. So now it's Sorry, Jamie, what's, what's your favorite color? Purple. Okay, so I'll, I'll just I'll... keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we can ask people the right questions um, that make them, you know, perhaps pointing out some of the inconsistencies in an official narrative to make people start going, hmm, yeah, maybe something is a bit fishy here. And asking the right questions that make people think for themselves help help them to then come to their own conclusion without shoving things down their throat and right. from looking like absolute new cases. We just help someone else see what we see really gently. So we've got that um, and we've, so about being, there's a first section is about being a successful activist. So to wake people up, um, we've got how to organize um, and orchestrate things like demonstrations, protests, petitions, etc. And then there's uh, how to come from a place of being empowered. You know, so I, I noticed a lot of activists, they're quite angry. Um, I was quite an angry little activist back in the day. And, you know, it's a very nice release. It's great to go shouting at people. It's a nice release of anger personally. It feels good, but uh, it's not very effective. It's, if anything, it's very counterproductive. So I want to help inspire activists to come from a place of being in, in, uh, empowered not from a place of wounded little child that just needs to shout at everyone and release some steam. And when we can come from that place of being empowered, it, it's so much more effective um, and it's so much more unifying because we need to realize that the people who aren't awake yet, they're not separate from us. Um, they have just been brainwashed. Um, you know, we've been quite lucky really that we're able to see what we see. Um, it's you know, a lot of the people can't. So we, we judge them, we call them sheep. I've been guilty of it too. But we have to realize, you know, they're just victims of of the programming. Um, so if we can understand that and come from a place of being more empowered, then it's much more unifying and people are find it much easier to, to relate to us. Um, off the top of my head, I think the next section is all about um, walking your talk really. So. I remember going back on protests back in the day and we'd be protesting against big corporation, corporate takeover. At the end of it, some of the guys would be like, hey, yeah, great day, guys. Let's go to McDonald's. And I'd just be like, are you serious? Are, like, are you, you know, come on, guys. So um, I think the key thing that we have to focus on is, you know, like Gandhi says, you know, be the, be the change you want to see. Every pound we spend, is a voting slip, right, for what we want in the world. So if we want to see change in the world, we have to walk our talk. So in that section, um, I want to help people walk their talk. So I'm going to have two sections um, that will dominate that that part, which will be, one, a list of ethical companies to, that I want to promote. So it gives people some more ethical options that they can integrate into their daily purchases. And then there will also be what will be called the shit list. Because how many people don't know that 
brands like L'Oreal test on animals. And I think if they knew that, they probably wouldn't buy L'Oreal anymore. Or how many people don't know that the CEO of Nestle said that the, that water shouldn't be a human right? He's an absolute lunatic. They're absolutely insane. And I think if more people knew about what was going on with a lot of these corporations, these companies, they wouldn't want to put, put their money that way anymore. So uh, a big part of Activist Toolbox is going to be about encouraging people to walk their talk and use these ethical companies that I list over people like you know, anything from Johnson & Johnson or Nestle or Coca-Cola or any of these horrible corporations that are destroying our planet and destroying our health and brainwashing our children. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a big part is about walking our talk. And then we're going to have the spiritual toolbox. And that's actually going to be a separate website that's going to sit side by side with activist toolbox. And what I really want activist toolbox to do is not just empower activists, but also be a bridge between activism and spirituality, because I think ultimately they go hand in hand. And I don't want it to be wishy washy. I don't want it to be fluffy or anything like that. It just wants some really, um, really grounded tools that people can use and integrate into their life to empower themselves, you know? Yeah, I agree. Right, just bringing myself back. Yeah, man. <laughs> I agree. It, it's all about balance. You know, what you said is completely true. You get the free, freedom fighters that can be very angry and try to put the message across in a very aggressive, angry way. Then you can get the light workers that say, no, we just need to sit there and meditate and everything's going to be fine. No, you have to find the balance between both and that sounds like that's what you're doing you're providing the information and the guidance in order to create a healthy activist mm. somebody where people will are full of respect for what they do they don't um it's the word i'm looking for they don't put anybody down for what they believe in it's hard jamie it's hard but it's yeah. very hard to watch it's a bit like watching sometimes a mother watching a child putting their finger in into a plug uh, electricity plug and, and and you can't do anything you just got let, let that child you know mm. that adult that you can't change it it's, they're not children they're adults but you can only do your job and an amazing woman said to me, my best friend now she's like my sister Janie she said Lauren you're going out there to save the whole world but you can't you've just got to save one person at a time by being the best you can be, that's it. Mm. And so that's what you're doing. You you can't go out there and, and save the whole world. You've got to just do your best to be as kind and as balanced as you can be and use that as much as you can to help people to ask the question like, how come Lauren or Jamie are so healthy? Hmm? I wonder why they're so healthy. I wonder why they're so happy. I wonder why they're so um, balanced. Maybe I could be that way. Mm. And that's a good way. It's like learning by example. I mean, as I say, we all go through our ups and downs, but it's finding that balance. And it sounds like that's what you're trying to provide with what you're doing here, which is very, very important. Yeah, I was quite fortunate when I was in Ibiza. Um, the universe seemed to just guide me through some of the most incredible different spiritual um, tools out there. And I was doing all sorts of different therapies and I didn't even end up paying for most of it. You know, most of it just seemed to happen to me. It was like I was being given these tools that I, so I could then share them with other people, you know, and I was doing things like uh, huge amounts of family. I really recommend anyone to check that out, Family Constellation, because that's one of the most profound things I've ever done in my life. Can you, sorry, can you, to hear. can you explain that? Is that when you are able to, I think I did one of those in the therapeutic community where mm. I recovered. It's where everybody represents a person in your family and you're able to say what you really feel. Is that it? More or less, Is yeah. It? It's an incredible thing. It really proves that we are all one consciousness. Because what happens, let's say you're in a group of eight people and whoever's turn it is to have their family constellation done, um, they would sit with the facilitator. And let's say, for example, one of the most common things I would see is is like um, my when my girlfriend that I had in Ibiza, she was a family constellation facilitator. So I sat through many, many of these. And um, yeah, a common thing would be like women would be... Um, 
uh, are regularly manifesting abusive relationships. So basically, we inherit programming for up to six generations back. You know, we carry this this family karma, which doesn't belong to us, but it plagues our reality, and it's not ours. But we can clean that, and family constellation, I believe, is probably the quickest way of doing it. So let's say, for example, you're a, a lady who's constantly manifesting abusive men uh, as your partner. You would probably sit with the facilitator, and she would say to you, okay, can you pick someone out of the group to represent your mother? And the, literally the second that person agrees to represent the mother they embody the energy of that person it's really it's weird it's really creepy and it doesn't sound very believable but honestly it's it's it happens and it's very real and i've represented many many people and you really feel their energy it's really strange and that doesn't matter whether they're still alive or not you know there's been times i've been asked to represent someone's father or something and i could be like a really timid little man i could just be like oh no i just want to hide in the corner or I could just come out and I want to own the energy of the space. Everyone must know I'm here. You know, you really feel it. It's incredible. So say, so this woman might say, find someone to represent the mother and father. And they would be interacting as the mother, father in front of her. And these people perhaps have never met before. And they have no idea about the woman. Um, but she'd be looking at the, these two who represent the mother and father. And they'd be like, this is insane. That is literally exactly how my mother and father would act. It's just literally creepy. And it was never wrong. Um, and what you can do is you can observe the interaction between the two. And after a while, you can start seeing patterns. So you might say, OK, cool. So obviously, this guy is not very nice to your mum. And you can say to the father, how do you feel towards this woman? He might say, oh, I, it's just my woman. You know, she's here to, to cook for me. And she's here to look after the house while I go and work. I, you know, he's not that bothered. He's just a little bit emotionally detached. So, you're like, OK, well, let's see where this comes from bring two people in to represent the grandparents and then watch how they interact. And it might become apparent that the grandfather was working in the military. He was a bit of a robot man, very cold, and was abusive to his his wife, the grandmother. And you say, OK, well, this is obviously where this comes from. He's a military man and, you know, he doesn't really see his wife as a human. So that's when you can heal that energetically. So you could say to the granddad, OK, I need you to look into your wife's eyes and and see a human there. And I want you to love that woman. I want you to apologize to her. And once he softens and he does that, then you move to the parents and say, look, now you guys need to heal this. I need you to look into your wife's eyes and see her as a human. And once that's been healed at the place that it originates from, incredible things start happening. The whole family dynamic changes. You are released from this sort of karma and then you can go on and start manifesting a, a, a decent man because you no longer have that pattern that you're repeating and not only does it work for you but it makes it ripples out into your whole family and it's strange how it works and i was very skeptical when she first told me about it um, but the first thing that well, the first session i was involved in was called healing the relationship with your father and i had actually fallen out with my dad um he lives in the isle of man and i'd fallen out with him at his wedding and i hadn't spoken to him for about a year so we did this session and literally i I, it must have been no more than four days he rang me out of the blue and I said this is unbelievable and um, when I told her she said well yeah of course he did crazy so yeah this family constellation is an incredible tool um, and then there's so many spiritual tools that we can use like this um, you know even just breathing techniques like I am um, doing a holotropic breathing breathwork session I mean I was having uh, experiences from that that were on on par with an ayahuasca ceremony um and it, i you know i cried for like 45 minutes unbelievable just from breathing and you know if, if everyone realized the power of breath that would probably be one of the most empowering things for humanity to realize that this one simple tool that we need absolutely nothing else but other than ourselves can can be extremely powerful for us you know and that includes things like you know the wim hof method as well of course um and then there's working with plant medicines as well. And I think this stuff is really important for us to sort of tap into for anyone who feels like that could be a, on their path. You know, this is great for clearing, um, great for finding out our power, reconnecting with our true essence and um, just digging really deep within ourselves and healing, you know? Yeah. There's so much, Jamie. I mean, I'm so grateful and excited you're saying all of this because I don't know if you remember, if you know, because we weren't in contact, but I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder um, when my mum died and, you know, instead of giving me grief counselling. But anyway, 
I'm very grateful that it happened because I went into a therapeutic community for nearly two years and it was all without medicine. On the NHS, no one knows, no one knows, but all on the NHS and um, we did similar work. And, but to me, um, everything, all the work, I, I mean, I've done 10 days silent retreats. I've done a few of those. I did one Vipassana yeah. in, in uh, Australia. That was one year when there was a massive war going on as usual in Israel between them and someone else. And um, I didn't know what to do. And so I thought, well, I'll go into meditation. And when I come out, hopefully it'll either be over or whatever. I've got to learn to live with it. And so I went into 10 days to be passionate. And I, oh, it was so dark, you know, that all of that meditation, I had to face so much darkness because there was no communication. Yeah, all you yeah. did was meditate from 5 a.m. till you went to bed. And I remember going to see the facilitator and saying, I can't cope with this darkness. And she, she told me to do yoga. I was put onto a yoga program in order to release some of this darkness. And then I did uh, Amravati, you know, I've, I did, I've done 10 day retreats in Amravati near me. And um, there's so much, I mean, we used to have a lot more, obviously it was a lot easier. You could just go to a Buddhist retreat and do a 10 day meditation. Now everything's closed, but let's not go into all of that. Now you've got to be on your own. You've got to go inside and you've got to do it all on your own. But I tell you, one of the best things that I feel that was given to the human race is the 12 steps. The 12 steps of um, AA, mm. uh, which can be adapted. And before I met Martin, well, you remember Martin, we're, we're separated now, but before I met him, I did a massive 12 steps because my relationships were going down, 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 down. And so I had no option. I did a massive step four. And I looked at every single relationship with a man that I'd had. And there was always exactly the same pattern. Mm -hmm. Always, every single time. It was always my choice. My intuition said, no. <laughs> but I went, <laughs> you know. And, and so when I did that, I, 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 I took about a year out and I worked on myself. Then I met Martin, it was completely different, completely different, different vibration, everything was different. But to me, the 12 steps, you go, in, you go in, first of all, you admit you're powerless over everything, which we are. Then you say there is a power greater than ourselves. And I don't believe in a religious God like you, I believe in a consciousness in love love to me is everything unconditional love love is god god is love like the teachings of a course in miracles I, have you studied the course in miracles a little bit yeah it's beautiful it's it's jesus just says that all there is is love there's nothing else you know that's all there is everything else is an illusion and it's really interesting that everything that's happening to us when in the awakening is on a, I don't know about you, but I've been left on alone, just me and two cats. No family, nothing, no one around me whatsoever, except on the phone. Great, beautiful starseed friends on the phone that we keep each other staying. I've got no one except Martin comes here maybe once a week, brings food and then goes back to his family, his mum and dad. The, I have had to be able to understand everything and one of the biggest lessons is attachment. And of course, the miracles, Jesus says, do not create special relationships because we are supposed to unconditionally love ourselves and everyone. And we were brought up to believe that our families are going to love us. So no. So when you do this family constellation thing, um, when I was in the therapeutic community, we did one before we left. We definitely did one. And um, because it was all about all these techniques they brought together, just start and, and constellations and Buddhism. They never wanted to admit how spiritual they were on the NHS, believe it or not. But it was all there. And I was one of the luckiest people in the world because I woke up in there and realized that my childhood abuse was not my fault. I woke up in there. I got like eight months of tough love. 
and one day the, 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 the penny dropped, boom, and that was it. If it wasn't for the therapeutic community, I wouldn't be here now. So what I'm saying is all of these techniques, they were brought together in some way. And this family constellation thing that you're talking about is, is as you say, you are able to take back your power. And when a human takes back their power, like you are, when you're doing whatever you're doing, all the work you're doing, you're not just sitting there saying, oh God, poor me, I've been stuck here. And I'm, I'm, I just want to go back to my planet, which we do on and off, you know, but we still get on with it. I, I get on here and I think, Lauren, I feel like shit today. I'm going to spread some love today. I'm moving on TV. And then I, suddenly I feel good. And you're doing the same, you know, in a roundabout way. I'm, I'm trying to say that it's all about us taking responsibility for our lives. You can't ask anybody to fix you anymore. You can't, you know, the beauty of this awakening, some people will see it as a terrible thing. I see it as the best thing that could happen to the human race. You cannot go to a doctor and say, fix me. Mm. Can't. That's what this is all about. You have got to go inside and figure out, what am I missing here? What's my body missing? Am I happy? Am I tired? Am I stressed? Am I drinking water? Am I taking vitamin C, D, whatever? That's you've got to figure it all out yourself. It's like every all your support has been taken away from you. You're falling out. I don't know about you, but how do you get on with your family at the moment? Because all the star seeds I know are, are, are feeling really alone. Most of them have lost their families in the way that they don't believe the same as they do. Um, I know I have. Um, the whole family in Israel cut me off um, again uh, because of my beliefs. And um, so how are you getting on like that? Are you, do you feel that you're getting on okay with your family or do you feel like as you do, you're a different species? How do, how are you, how's that going for you at the moment? I'm not very connected with my blood family um, other than my mother, of course, cause she's, she's one of us. Um, but actually I find now the tribe is really gathering um, so I have what I would call my 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 family around me all the time, and I'm you know we always we always get together regardless of what's going on. We'll always go and see each other. We always have gatherings at each other's houses. You know we'll go out and have a bonfire. We don't really you know irrelevant irrespective of what's going on. That's what we do. And the tribes are gathering now, and um, that was one thing that that was um, quite common in the channels in the channel guidance that was coming through is they would say you know time is time now is to gather the tribes because it's time for us to unite um and this is actually going to be another function of activist toolbox as well um so um maybe i can go back to that briefly um as well so yeah i got into the spiritual toolbox but um after that there will be uh, a few other things like um how to uh, protect yourself online how to use tool browsers and you know a vpn how to browse online securely etc um, then there's going to be how to be less reliant on the system. So how to grow your own food, how to live off grid, stuff like this. And then a few other bits. So that's phase one, the activist training camp. And um, we're then going to introduce a shop. Um, and then phase three, we're going to have some news, which are, you know, events and stuff. So you can find out when the next protests are on and stuff like this. And then phase three, once I've raised more capital, we're going to introduce a community functionality, which I'm hoping is going to help unite different activist groups from all around the world so that we can all band together, offer each other skills, um, and meet people all across the world and um, basically unify into one group of activists together, you know, because there's so many wonderful people and organizations popping up all around the world now. You know, people are waking up very, very, very quickly. Um, so, but we don't we're not necessarily aware of our numbers i mean unless you are one of the ones who have been to the to the massive marches you know i don't know if you were there on the 24th of last month there must have been a million million of us descended on london it was unbelievable it was one of the best days i've ever had in my life it was like a huge festival uh, but unless you're getting involved with that this is a lonely journey um and i just stop you there that that's exactly what i wanted to talk about is the intense loneliness and if you haven't got the skills that we do if you don't have a dream 
or a passion, then the loneliness can destroy you. I know that because um, I went into a lot of depression and thank God I'm not in it now, but the intense loneliness and that's where we need something where people, like for example, as I say, you get the massive marches, which are brilliant, but then you go home and that's it. Or you get one hour, two hours in the park on a Sunday. I stopped going altogether because I couldn't deal with the heartache of coming back to the emptiness for a whole week. I couldn't deal with it. So I've started going back now because I'm in a different space now. But that's what we need to take care of. Not just our loneliness, but the loneliness of those that are not on the same vibration. How do you do that? How do you do it? That I'm not sure. Right. Because, the, because I, I'm thinking of, I want moving on TV on the box. <laughs> I want moving on TV in every single house where everyone can watch something silly like a silly happy news, anything, or a tiny little sun meditation so they know that there's love out there instead of sitting there watching, which I'm not going to mention, but you know what I mean, day in, day out, day in, and hiding behind the couch and thinking that the world's coming to an end. No, it isn't. Your world doesn't have to come to an end. You can get out there. You can stand up. You can say, I'm not having it, and take back your power. You mm -hmm. just need to have something on that box. So my dream is to get moving on TV, literally in these house, in people's houses. That that's a big dream. But coming back to what you were saying, is uh, where are you living at the moment? What part of the country are you in? Uh, Maidenhead. You what? Maidenhead. You mean you're? I'm just on the road. For me. What? <laughs> Only a few weeks. Okay, I'll be in touch once you come here. Yeah, I've been all over. I've done this interview face to face. And, you know, Where? What part of Maidenhead? I'm not far from the from the dual carriageway. Oh my God! All right, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I never knew that. That is incredible. Because you used to live in Reading, didn't you, originally? Yeah. When we first met. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, by the way, have you heard anything at all from Helen? Helen Greenway, do you ever hear? Yeah. You know, she opens, I haven't heard from her for years. Yeah. Anyway, this this is <laughs> becoming a bit, oh, you're kidding me. If yeah. The thing is, the loneliness, as I say, being on your own, I was on my own for too long, but it made me go inside, it made me discover my singing again, and like running down the road singing, and going into parks and singing, and singing Born Free for everyone, you know what I mean? Born Free. I and, can, and I can them. certainly imagine you doing something like that, Lauren, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, so I'll talk to you about it when we come off um, off the screen. But that is incredible. I'm so grateful. I can't wait to see you. But coming back now, okay, so let's go on. So the activist toolbox is amazing. And you do need something on there for people to know where these gatherings are happening, not just the month.